No. That was quick. All right, here we are. Um, we're seeing uh, people continue to join us for the kickoff of the first Timor. Uh, people might wonder where uh, where the name comes from. Um, it's from we have so. Toaster Lab has been running the Mixed Reality Performance Atelier for about a year now. Um, we turned this into the Toaster Lab uh, Mixed Reality Performance Hack. And then as I kept writing it, and because um, I uh, I type with home keys on my right hand and I hunt and peck with my left hand, uh, a typo turned it into T-Morph at some point. And uh, I like to pronounce things. So that's that's sort of how where the name comes from. Uh, uh, and how we got here. So um, we've got a a, a, a packed schedule uh, to get through for this kickoff event. Um, as we have our participants uh, file into our Zoom room where we're having our first conversation about working around uh, low bandwidth and remote situations. Uh, this has been inspired by uh, our conversations with partners at Nakai Theater uh, in Whitehorse. Uh, I'll get to the agenda in a moment, but uh, first I wanted to make a few uh, acknowledgements. Um, we're in uh, Toronto, or Takaranto, uh, which has been taken care of by the Anishabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron Wendat, and the Metis for, for many years. Uh, the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, uh, uh, um, uh, are, are currently uh, the treaty holders in this in this un, uh, in this territory, uh, which is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great, Great Lakes region, which is especially uh, important to mention at this point because uh, Toaster Lab uh, stands in solidarity with uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and anti-racist efforts. Um, uh, I say this more personally than maybe in my institutional or organizational roles, uh, but uh, I'm a, as you might be able to tell from the stream, I'm a white male living in Canada and I uh, have a tenured faculty position. So I benefit from uh, significant uh, institutional privilege uh, and think that it's part of my responsibility in holding this privilege to work for those who do not benefit from the same privilege or have experienced oppression as a result of uh, some me or someone like me. Uh, holding that privilege. Uh, a lot of our work at Toaster Lab is about uh, revealing hidden stories of place uh, and to support mutual understanding and to lift up histories that are or are being uh, erased. And Team Morph is about boosting projects to make storytelling of this kind with new technologies and make it accessible and to break down artists for uh, or break down barriers for artists to engage with them and allied collaborations with diverse communities. Um, with different levels of access is one of the core topics of what we're dealing with uh, in this hack here. We also have started to acknowledge uh, the problematic use of Zoom and Facebook at this time. It's been able to bring us together um, quite a bit, uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, there's been concern uh, since before the pandemic of, of Zoom and its uh, and the way that it approaches uh, security and its recent statements around cooperation and encryption uh, for unpaid accounts. Also, with um, this is going out to Facebook Live, and we do a lot of our uh, communications through Facebook. Uh, but we do want to acknowledge that uh, we're aware of the problematic nature uh, of Facebook in terms of how. Uh, the company's platform has been used in dividing society, interfering in elections, and virally spreading false information. We will try and give you correct information to the best of our abilities throughout um, our, our events. Uh, but here we are. We critique society while we also participate in it. Um, we have to acknowledge uh, the generous support of the Canada Council, which has made all of the atelier possible, including uh, this event and the, the two-year project that we find ourselves in the middle of. Uh, we also uh, are partnered with HowlRound, for, we, who we're streaming with right now, and the Festival of Live Digital Art and Spiderweb Show, which is also going on right now. And if you go to folda.ca, you can see a lot of their online programming that's happened with the festival this year. We originally thought that this hackathon would be in Kingston, uh, 
uh, with the with the festival, and we'd be doing this in person, which is part of what uh, has led its online format has led to its sort of extended nature. Uh, and we have a couple other public events that will be coming up with this that um, I'm sure that you'll hear from uh, sort of everybody. Uh, uh, at some point about, as if you're connected to somebody who's involved. Uh, be, on this coming Thursday, we have a performance of Indigenous Futurities, Dancing Earth and Cyberspace, a partnership with Dancing Earth, led by Ruan Tagen. Uh, that's going to be on Thursday at uh, the 18th at 9.30 Eastern, and that's with special support from Colorado College and involves um, uh, uh, collaborators from uh, across uh, Turtle Island and then uh, down into the Pacific as well. And then we're going to be doing, as we work through this, this hack and figure out exactly what it is, um, we're going to uh, have our final presentations uh, on Friday uh, at noon, similar to this format where we'll have a couple hour session to talk about what has come out of this conversation. If you need any of this information, it can be found on our website at toasterlab.com slash atelier. There's also a link just there on the front page and all of our social channels. And uh, all of this will also be coming out through HowlRound as well. So we're trying to make it as easy as possible to access this um, in the ways that we're currently able to do that. Uh, how we're going to run today. So um, this, is, this is where we're at. Um, some people might not be familiar with what Toaster Lab is. Um, my esteemed colleague and life partner, Justine Garrett, <laughs> uh, will give a bit of a rundown of what exactly Toaster Lab is. Uh, Andrew St. Pierre, who has, uh, uh, or some pray, I always do that. I'm sorry, Andrew, um, uh, will uh, talk a little bit through the uh, context in which we've been working thus far and some of the environments in which we've been working where we've been bringing in mixed reality content and the technical challenges that we've been working with um, there already across a number of different projects, uh, both uh, within high and low bandwidth scenarios. Uh, Jacob Zimmer from Mackay Theater will talk very uh, more specifically about the White Horse context uh, and the conversations we've been having over the course of the last year that have presented specific challenge uh, uh, challenges to this way of working and how to bring that up into uh, his communities, which have much less uh, connectivity, even in the population uh, centers uh, there in the Yukon. We have a keynote, uh, which I'm really excited about, and uh, I, will, I will introduce her with a more full bio once we get to this point in the program from page dancing or around performing resilience. Uh, uh, which will then take us to the more practical elements with Julie Driver, who's co-producing this with us from Artifact VR, uh, who will talk ab exactly about how we're actually going to make this work, given that we're not in the same space with each other. We'll open it up for a conversation with the assembled mass of people that you can see in the grid on your screen right now. I'll change that to a more dedicated view as everybody talks a bit more. Uh, and, uh, and then bring us to wrap up, where we'll go into a closed session so we can uh, align ourselves over the next week of activity. So with that being said, uh, thank you again, everybody, for joining. I'm going to turn it over to Justine here to my right uh, to talk a little bit about what Toaster Lab actually is. Hi, guys. Thanks for joining us today. We're really grateful for your participation. Um, Toaster Lab is Andrew, Ian, and myself, and we work with artists uh, to tell place-based immersive reality stories and that can be through live performance through apps vr uh, workshops and uh, we also do our own projects and we also boost the projects of others through the mixed reality performance atelier which we're very grateful for it's a two-year deep dive into mixed reality methods specifically centered around performers and performing artists and how we can incorporate those uh, new tools such as 360 video, uh, virtual reality, uh, mixed reality, augmented reality, et cetera, all the R's um, into theater making practice. And we believe sort of our thesis is that um, as theater makers, we are primed to think about the world in an expansive, non-flat way. Um, beyond just a screen and not that we're excluding filmmakers but we we believe that these tools are going to enhance the practice of theater makers uh, more generally and we're excited to take a look at the projects that are being led by theater makers and incorporating these tools and figuring out how we can boost them our own projects have included transmission which is a um city-based uh, game, the city of Edinburgh, that you can play on your phone through an app. 
created by Andrew and um, with content created by Ian and myself and many, many other collaborators, um, which led people on a treasure hunt to find more story around the city of Edinburgh um, around uh, first contact with alien life and a interstellar voyage of two sisters. So it goes. Um, and we also have done workshops with youth on using 360 cameras and in libraries. And we're really excited to hear more about your projects and what you're interested in working on over the next week or so. Um, we, we're just grateful again for your participation. So thank you so much for joining us for two more. Yeah, I think transmission was our first experience with bandwidth limitations where oh, yeah. we started from the very beginning uh, because even though we were in a city center, um, leading people around, especially during a, f a festival where there's a lot of network congestion yeah. and in a medieval cool. city made it extremely hard to uh to uh to get everybody to stream we were streaming all that content mm -hmm. so it's been something that's been part of what what we've uh we've been concerned about from the beginning uh but to put that into more ex uh extreme uh, more extreme environment i'm actually going to turn it over to jacob zimmer who's in white horse who the moment we started talking about this we've been starting to to uh play with like what can be done and how do we get people into that space Jacob, over to you. Thanks, Ian, and uh, thanks for everyone at Toaster Lab to hear me. You can all hear me, right? Mm -hmm. It's the Fringe show that I'm terrified. We're going to have a lot of Fringe shows called You Can All Hear Me, Right? Um, so, yeah, I'm uh, three years. I've lived on the territory of the Kwanlin Dun and the Tan Kwachin Council uh, in the Yukon, uh, which is uncommon in that we have 12 uh, self-governing First Nations on the territory. Um, it's also uncommon in that we have 40,000 people um, in a very large landmass. Um, and so that's about half of a city ward for any of you in, in Canada. City wards tend to be about 80,000 people. Um, so we're a small, we have a small humans uh, population spread out over a large distance. Um, with not great internet. We have one provider um, who, it's very expensive. Uh, we're posting in the Ask a Yukon channel for those of you who are doing the hack, just some of the things around Northwest Cell pricing and, and, and the realities of that. And, and it's just, it's different um, on cost and availability. And we've included also a map where there's actually only about 5% of the territory is covered by cell phones. Um, and even less of that is 4G. Um, and so these realities when I'm in these conversations and people are like, oh, you can stream live. And it's like, no, no, we can't. Um, and especially upload. One of the major things around how Canadian telecom is regulated is is that our download speeds are regulated at higher than our upload speeds, which means that we have a problem of creation here, where people just assume that the internet is is a consumption tool. And so, how we start making things, because we have a lot of pretty amazing reality up here um, that we can share, and we've got you know locations that are impossible anywhere else. Uh, but we also have a population that didn't move here because of the internet. Um, and their love of gadgets. They moved here because of their love of landscape and place. Um, if they moved here or they, or they were born here and they stayed because of their love of place. And so that just creates a very different context. I can't confirm, you know, the chances that people have the newest cell phone is really unlikely, especially if we're outside of Whitehorse. So Whitehorse is 40% government employment. We've got a lot of people with decent jobs Everywhere else, we're at a much lower level of sort of base employment. And again, technological interest. This is a place where a lot of people call. We still have seven digit phone numbers uh, and a lot of hotmail addresses. So it's not, it's not also a place where people are thinking, oh, I want to interact with a thing on my head, except in winter, right? And then I do know we will, like the moment you can put me on a beach um, in January, we will be there in our basements with our headsets on and our desk lamps shining brightly to try to pretend to be at a beach. Um, so I know we're going to consume it and I want to be able to create up here and I want to be able to create something ideally offsite 
off internet and then also be able to share it because if artists are going to live up here at all, we're going to have to share out beyond the territory uh, while also not um, trying to find a way to affect the brain drain, right? The fact that all the young artists move to Vancouver or Toronto. Um, and so how can we be creative here? How can we continue this work um, as theater makers where maybe timeliness isn't such the like liveness is less of the issue. This is always a, a question in these things that it's not so much about the liveness, but can it be delayed? And how do we capture and do some of those, those different things um, where we can get the landscape and the creativity um, and the culture that is here and share it uh, without sort of inst instantly leaving the territory. Um, and so these moments of conversation with people from um, around Turtle Island and, and even further um, is really amazing for us. So thanks for having us as part of this. Thank you, Jacob. Um, I realized that I've taken things slightly out of order. I apologize for that. I'm going to turn it now over to Andrew, uh, Andrew who I mentioned before, and, and, and to talk a little bit about the context in which we've been working from uh, a more technical standpoint of the challenges that um, really he's been um, grappling with in a real, in a, in a real way um, when in all of our projects. So Andrew, um, over to you. Hi, can, can everybody hear me? Yeah. I'm gonna do that thing. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, great, so I'm, uh, I'm uh, coming to you live from Switzerland where we fortunately do have pretty good bandwidth. So I actually am really fortunate. Honestly, I have a fiber connection, which is great. Although the interesting thing for me is that that was not always the case. So Switzerland um, is clearly a place that has uh, uh, connectivity and a fair amount of, of resources, but it's also a mountainous nation, sort of ringed by giant, ginormous mountains. And internet was not really a thing, and internet culture is not quite the same as it is in the rest of the world. So when we first arrived here, my bandwidth, um, just because I couldn't afford the $600 a month that it costs to get a reasonable connection that was equivalent to the cable connection I had back in Boston, uh, was significantly smaller. So anyway, things things change, but things are definitely different. And, and what I think is interesting is that it's not really a technical limitation here, but it gets a little bit to what uh, Jacob was saying. It has to do with the type of people who live here, which they have a different relationship to the internet than you might see in an urban center in North America or the United States. Um, which is just an interesting thing to observe. Um, so getting back to what uh, Ian was specifically talking about, one of the first projects we worked on um, was in Edinburgh. And Edinburgh, yes, there were, so there were kind of two problems. There was the bandwidth problem. And there was also the problem that this was a locative piece that relied very heavily on GPS. And Edinburgh physically is a medieval city that's built with lots of very, very solid thick bricks, um, which uh, GPS signal doesn't propagate particularly well in. Um, and incidentally, exactly the same scenario happens in New York City for slightly different reasons, but you, you have a really hard time getting accurate location data in both of these places. And this also applies, again, to interior locations for similar reasons, any interior location. Where getting GPS data or locative data is quite tricky inside. Um, so all of that uh, sums up to kind of the, the sort of the world that we're working in or trying to figure out how, to, how can we tell stories in different types of environments. Um, not all of which are ones that you would immediately think of as having low bandwidth problems. So you might not consider a library in the middle of New York City having an issue with bandwidth. But in fact, it does, because especially if you're trying to do something located, we can't really get that accurately. Um, so that's sort of like is my world is kind of trying to figure out how we can handle this. And also, uh, the big thing about, uh, about the work that we're doing is that we essentially kind of shift the load and I, and I, and I'm a big part of why I'm here actually is I'm really interested in hearing how, how you all are handling it like honestly I, I'm here mostly to learn um, but I'll say that from just just a briefly what we've noticed is that you can you can essentially time shift the, the work so a full streaming solution assumes that the phone doesn't have any of the content and that means that the content can be delivered at the time that the the audience member wants it right so that's kind of interesting and and, and nice um, the way to fix this problem, at least that we found, is that you have to say, okay, we need the content available ahead of time. So we, so we either preload the device or do something else more exotic. Now, the trouble with that is that it shifts the work in time from sort of during or after the app is released to well before 
which is really important when we're talking about theater creation. Because again, what I'm saying here is that if you want to do the theater piece online, I need all of the content as a developer. I need all of your content prior to releasing the app, which is really different than the notion that a lot of folks have of like, oh, it would be really cool if we can kind of practice with this. You can, but if you need to preload the content, we need to have it ahead of time. There's a whole process involved. So I'm going to stop talking, but I'll just say that that's, that's sort of the, the issues that are on my plate and that we talk about a lot. We're trying to come up with a ways uh, of trying to create tools that will help people do this more easily. But it's a tough problem and it has a lot more to do, I think, with the way that we produce work from my perspective and less to do with the technology, although there are certainly technical implications. So, hi. <laughs> uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, uh, so that gives you uh, like that is the the briefest way that we can run down um, all of the all of the considerations that we're trying to bring into the space together right now. Yeah. Um, we've run into it with our own projects and talking and imagining projects in other places. And so we wanted to open this up because a, a, a big part of how we're working through this atelier project is also about making things available um, to whatever extent that's around documentation, around open sourcing code. Part of it is also about fostering a community of people who actually make these things uh, because uh, while it's interesting and novel for us to make it individually um, as, as artists and not just producers um, looking to put work out there, it's also um, vital that there are other people doing the work so that it comes into conversation um, around how things around things happen. With all that sort of to, to, to give us a deeper dive uh, into into some of this contextual thinking that we're, we're having, um, I'm really excited to uh, introduce uh, Paige, our keynote speaker for today. Um, Paige Danzinger uh, is an inaugural Facebook Community Leadership Fellow and founder of Better World Museum. She is an AR, VR, XR artist, uh, has worked on the Internative uh, Spart City Architecture and AR Fashion, director of uh, VR Garden. She has exhibited or presented at uh, TEDx, uh, at the Guggenheim in New York, the Nobel Peace Prize Forum, Augmented World Expo, uh, Miami XR Expo, Facebook Global Safety and Wellness Summit, um, all over the world, uh, every continent. Uh, so um, it, it's just like thrilling to see the like the level of deep thinking that that Paige has as, as, um, been doing on this topic, especially given that the, the title of our talk today is around performing resilience uh, and about thinking about, uh, you know, all the way from climate change to uh, pandemics to the and I say too, as though these aren't all happening concurrently at the same time as we're presenting in this very moment. Um, our lives are full of, of stress. So her presentation uh, use, around using the uh, uh, Better World Museum, uh, using performance and mixed reality and, and group is all around creating community uh, resilience. Uh, so Paige, I'm going to turn it over to you because no one needs to hear me speak anymore. I just have to find you in the grid now. There you are. Thank you so much, Ian. Thanks so much. T-Morph and all of our friends here that are together. And I appreciate that you acknowledge that we are all on native land. And uh, that's including when we're here physically in Zoom or on Facebook or even in virtual reality. I'm coming to you live from Minneapolis, Minnesota, the home of George Floyd and um, I appreciate your acknowledgement of Black Lives Matter and uh, also the acknowledgement of uh, Black trans lives and that it's Pride Month and that has um, influenced my presentation today. So you'll see a smattering of rainbows in a the thematic display today. Thank you. So. I'm going to not speak too much about myself. Here's my social media. You can find me easily, Better World Museum, and talk really quickly about myself because I really just want to spend group time exploring performance together. 
at, at the end of this presentation, we can do some movement and, um, and time together. I'm in my museums are not neutral t-shirt because, well, museums are not neutral. I started out working in a museum in my local city. Uh, I had a host of different positions from security guard, working my way up through education, curatorial, um, uh, registration, public programs. And through it all, I kept asking myself, so what? <laughs> right? And, and at that time, uh, social media was just emerging and I was delving into creative technology and I committed myself in that moment um, one day that I had to somehow use creative technology and mobile, mobile phones to create this rainbow bridge and how we can like see each other's reflections within ourselves more easily by through the reflections through our phones. So here we are capturing each other's big eyes. And then fast forward and virtual reality was born and my rainbow became more th about the 360 global connection and how can we really, um, how can I take my story of me and create the story of we? And within that story of we create a movement, a movement for a better world, but also a movement for within us, right? And how, what does that movement feel and, and look like? Um, cellularly, spiritually, you know, within a community, and how does that really look in the world? And a lot of us have been grappling with this. I mean, right now, my beautiful city is covered with the expression of, of Black Lives Matter and how, how community and visual art and language can bring us together. So community is just at the forefront of the things that I'm doing and how I relate to stress and trauma. So a survivor of domestic violence I, I felt isolated. I felt um, powerlessness without technology in some way. And then when I used technology, uh, that, that helped me create the community that I really needed to transform that powerlessness into resilience, right? And that started out when right after our last um, presidential election, I felt a lot of stress, right? I was freaking out to, to just be honest with you. I was like, oh my God, how could we be in this situation? I feel vulnerable. And I had just gotten an uh, Oculus Rift donated to the museum. I drew a flower. I posted a link online inviting anyone in the world to contribute to the garden, the VR garden. And that has just grown, grown so much. Uh, it's created real world relationships and people near and far have drawn together, including at the MIT Reality Hackathon where we used um, uh, augmented reality. We used Vuforia and Unity to create an app where people would scan flower markers, these flower seeds, and see each other's drawings of a dandelion patch. I will post a link in the comments to the live feed later with uh, work that references that. So through the process of um, drawing dandelion patches with everyone at MIT to drawing guard VR gardens with people all around the world, what I've really done is um, teach people how to draw. And it's not that I'm teaching you how to draw, it's I'm kind of teaching you how to draw into yourself and bring out the best parts of you to make the world better. And that sometimes looks like this. Um, I have this, this thing that I say to everybody um, that the right hand is 
your, or your drawing dominant hand is your hand of all power. I'll play the video. Yeah. My drawing hand is my hand of all power. With it, I'm able to use my voice, my body, and my mind and my heart in empowering ways. Just by simply pressing the drawing button, I have everything I need to enact my voice of power. My supporting hand is my hand of infinite choices. So with it, I normally have brushes and tips on the palette in my disposal. Together with my hand of all power and my hand of infinite choices, I have all the opportunities in the world to share with you the things that are important and make the best decisions. In the okay, so you kind of get the gist that what I'm saying, no matter what the age is, um, like here, I'm saying the exact same thing, but to a 10 year old in China. And the way I just frame it is, this is your hand of all power. This is your hand of infinite opportunities. Together, you are, are in control of making the best choices in the world, right? And instantly, they feel like superheroes. They just, all this power goes into them and they feel ready, right? And sometimes I find like just the things that you say right before you teach somebody how to draw. Like I, I can't imagine just handing somebody a VR um, controller and say, here you go, squeeze the trigger and draw. Like that's violent gun language and it's, it's irresponsible. Like every moment is, a, is an opportunity for growth and connection and healing and education. And that, that is such a wasted moment um, so I, I've been really jumping into those, those like slowing down what happens right when we're about to try something new and, and really, um, we're trying something that most people have never done before drawing in VR, right? And so you feel vulnerable and you're scared and, and much like that same, same trauma feeling, right? Fight, flight, or freeze, whether you're in um, a violent situation or trying something new, you have the sense of vulnerability and it's sitting in your body and through drawing it out, like you're like drawing it out, right? So I started this performance exercise before I draw with people in which we, and it'll, it, this will just come up in like the first minute of this video. This is produced by XR Pioneers, our, our museum partners in China. And last summer as a Facebook fellow, I had the opportunity to work with XR Pioneer and their students. And this is, let's see, play. This is, I'm about to, in the first minute, it'll illustrate what I'm gonna talk about. So here I am like on stage drawing and I love doing that, can never do that enough. Now I start to like work with other people and it becomes like a physical and intimate interaction. But then here, what is this? What are we doing? Like what? Well, there we're playing this game, this empathy circle experience called I am a tree. And it was developed at Stanford. And then I've like reworked it for our Better World Museum. And we have this performance time together where we're dissolving all of those feelings of vulnerability. And we're connecting and like becoming a group before we ever do a group drawing, right? So we're all, before we've drawn and VR, we've already thrown away our voices of censorship. We've like experienced connection to each other. It's, it's an important part of my process I've found. 
Wait, I skipped one. Hi, I'm Mare. Okay, so we'll just go forward. That kind of translates. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue. I really want to show you the one before it, so I'm going to. Thank you. So that feeling of like needing to draw it out, um, like that first video where I was drawing the tree, I've made like 30 or so of these Bob Ross style videos where it's like drawing lessons. And lately I've been doing that again, but through Hello, creative healing. From and Museum. now we're doing those were Facebook spaces. And now I'm using a cross platform program Let's called Rec Room. Mood rainbow. So here we're gonna Use draw a mood colors. rainbow. Shape and through and size, these videos, I kind of explore rainbow, these like community, end, social, healing experiences. And then I'm going to paint. Be drawing so those are really exciting to me. Um, so we created this museum inside of Rec Room, which is a cross platform um, program accessible through iOS, PC. PlayStation, Steam, and Oculus. And I'm trying to um, create things that are more easily accessible. So today there's like Mozilla Hubs and there's Altspace and there's different ways to like, um, if you have a computer or a, a mobile phone with that, like in Rec Room here, you're able to access that through an app on my phone. So. Um, with that, it's, it's, it's cool. So um, these teenagers, these uh, a 13 year old and two 15 year olds built my museum and they were awesome. And they went from being uh, kids who were just having a good time together to um, leadership roles in the museum. We have a lead architect, we have um, uh, Maddie who we're creating uh, programming with, with our clubs, and she is also our new Holotar virtual educator. So all of the teens in which I've been working with in VR um, in Rec Room, and that includes, we have a 11 year old artist in residence right now, who's an interactive artist and environmentalist. Um, they're, they're creating great things and they're becoming leaders in these roles. So here's Maddie, and this is her first um, VR educator holotar. And maybe even through, um, you know, really like old, old projectors that some of these things in which we don't have access with internet or um, good download speeds could be explored even more in the hackathon. So I included it here. Hi, I'm Mare. Um, so today we're making a rainbow. To, in order to make a rainbow, you must include the colors red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, King, brown, and black. Thank you. So involving people is something that's really important to us at the museum. Um, it's not just about me, it's really about we and creating a better world together. And at Better World Museum, there's a leadership role for everybody. There's not one person that doesn't have something great that they do and love and can contribute. And one of uh, an important leader in our museum is Tara Kilbride, who is here in the hackathon today. And I'm really excited to share this work with you. Tara has been part of our museum for several years as a lead performance artist. And she has led yoga and VR and live performances at art opening, including our participants and visitors, and she recently won this um, contest in between our small group of uh, museum team leaders to create something with our logo. And she 
This is her first time inside of Facebook Spaces where she did this museum meditation with our Earth and I wanted to invite you all as a group. Maybe we can grid our, our, our um, images and move together. My favorite keynotes are actually where the person doesn't really talk and we get to do something fun together. So I want to invite you to, oops, move with Tara on the last one. Wait, here we go. Yeah, we're gonna, yeah. So this is a meditation and it, it's maybe something we can do together with our last few minutes together and kind of meditate on the earth together and the way we want to heal and present and hold each other and the privilege of our breath that we're able to have today. We can hold each other on the earth in new ways through this experience. I'm going to turn up the sound. Anyway, when I feel really stressed out, I like to put this video on and just kind of like wah and move with Tara. I feel like it brings me back to the, my breath and back into the core of the earth. Not sure how many minutes we have left. We have three minutes or five minutes or 30 seconds. But I'm really appreciative to Toaster Lab, Timor, Architect Lab, and MIT Reality Hack for bringing it meet together with Julie Driver to meet the good people here today. And I want to thank you all for being together and making a movement and performance together to make a better world. Um, yeah. And I guess through that we could dance party out of it. Yeah. Thank you. I'm stressed out. Dancing. Thank you, babe. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paige. There's a couple of ideas that I think that are going to be really important for us. I, there's lots of ideas for us to take. Yes. Or they're really important. One thing, uh, two that I'll highlight, and then I'm going to turn it over to Julie to actually just talk about the practicalities of how the next week is going to run. One is uh, collaborator care, which came up, like care of how you're working with people. We've, in previous conversations, talked a lot about audience care, and that's one of the unique things about working in a perform like a live performance environment that you're thinking about how the audience gets into the performance environment. 
um, which is something that we don't always see happen within a within a virtual reality environment. Like it's like you've got the headset on and off, and I really appreciate that, especially in the demonstrations, like the, the workshops that we're doing, the amount of care that you're talking about there, but both as a as a way of something for the audience and then also for the collaborators. So as we're coming together and thinking about care and like moving to this grid format where we've sort of, you know, pulled down uh, the hierarchy. Um, those on the live feed, uh, you can only see those with cameras on. So there's there's still a little bit of, uh, of difference there, but that we've now got everybody together that we can have this shared experience. Um, I was just in the National Arts Center up here just did a, a few days around a project called the Green Room. So the last day was a co-creation event that was similarly about how do we start to perform these sort of social interactions through this sort of format. We've got lots of other ideas. We're going to be talking about those in uh, the second uh, non-streaming portion. We'll start talking about it before we wrap today. But Julie, can I uh, turn it to you to talk uh, a little bit about how things are going to, how we're going to work. I'm going to highlight you. Yes, thank you. And I suppose everyone can hear me just fine, right? Yes, OK. Um, I have a question. Um, have people been to hackathons before? Um, raise your hand if you have. Just uh, three, four, five, six, seven. OK, so maybe a quarter of you, I'm guessing. Um, Excellent. That means there's lots of room for learning. This hackathon is a learning experience rather than some hackathons, which are competitions. So um, first and foremost, I wanted to say I hope that you and your families are healthy and safe during this really chaotic time. Um, despite the new challenges facing all of us, we recognize this need to continue to create, collaborate, and connect. And this hackathon is an excellent way to do that. Uh, welcome to Timor. Uh, over the next week, we will either help someone share their story or invite others to help express your story. So I would like to talk a little bit about um, the culture of the hackathon, how we're going to communicate, and then finally the format uh, that the hackathon will take. The culture we um, aim to shape at Timor is one of inclusion a culture that includes accessibility and diversity for both the participants and the things created at the event. Your positive, friendly, safe, and welcoming environment at Teamwork is governed by our code of, code of conduct, which is found on the Toaster Lab website. We value your imagination, ingenuity, and kindness, and shared vision of participants who work together. So as Ian uh, talked about uh, collaboration skills, collaboration will be essential um, for positive outcomes of the hackathon. Communication-wise, uh, we, uh, the organizers, mentors, and participants will be using Discord to communicate um, during and after the hackathon. We're requesting that you use Discord as much as possible. Um, you can check the announcements channel for the daily agenda and for changes throughout the day. So if you're offline for a little while, come back, check announcements to see if you've missed any changes. Uh, we would love to see daily status of your project in the project channel that your project has been assigned to. There will be uh, uh, channels for questions to organizers, mentors, uh, and the Yukoners, uh, plus other channels to ask for more specific support for development, production, narrative, or general help for your project. Uh, we've added in six voice channels for you to have meetings and if we have a chance, we're going to figure out how to set up the video channels within Discord. Um, so for the format of the next week, we're going to start today with uh, lightning talks. Uh, these will be the project proposals that will be presented uh, shortly after this talk. And then in the Discord channels, you'll end up forming teams of four or five people. So you'll hear the projects that you're interested in and go to the channel and start chatting with uh, the other people in the group. Decide if that's the project that you'd like to work with. Uh, for each team, you'll want some combination of artists, storytellers, designers, and at least one technical person, for instance, a game developer or a sound designer. 
your team will set uh, your own meeting times. Through the week, we encourage you to host pop-up presentations and discussions. This hackathon, unlike an in-person hackathon mm -hmm. being virtual, um, we're not all in the same room. Some people may have more time to put towards their project and some people less uh, things to take care of uh, wherever you are situated. So we're hoping that you will offer and we will encourage you to offer to host a pop-up conversation, a presentation uh, for any topic either related to exactly the project you're working on or to the uh, theme of our hackathon altogether, which is um, how to uh, give immersed performances or how to deal with immersive performances in remote places and low bandwidth situations. We will have team check-in meetings. Um, the first one is scheduled for tomorrow and the next uh, meetup that we'll do together is on Wednesday afternoon. And finally, Friday, you will be presenting your hacks to the rest of the hackers and also to the world via live stream. I'm looking forward to an unforgettable week of collaboration, ideation, creativity. I can't wait to see what your projects uh, will be all about. Uh, we're on to our next task today, which is listening to lightning talks and forming teams. So thank you very much. Thanks, Julie. Um, so just uh, a couple of final housekeeping things before we exit this, uh, before we exit the feed. Uh, as a reminder, we have a couple of public events uh, that are coming up. Julie just mentioned that we'll be doing our final presentations this coming Friday. Uh, but before that, we also have uh, on Thursday at 9.30 p.m. Eastern uh, performance with a collaboration that's uh, in many ways related and some of it will come into. We'll talk about in one of those uh, pop-up talks that are that are um, self-organized throughout the week uh, on uh, Indigenous Futurities, uh, collaboration with Dancing Earth, uh, uh, performance, and Rulon Tagen, uh, Dancing Earth in Cyberspace, which will uh, be, uh, like I said, on Thursday, June 18th. Check the Toaster Lab website and our social channels for the coordinates for that, also hosted for free on HowlRound Like This Is. And with that, we're going to close out this, this public session, introducing everybody to the information and kicking off um, uh, the frame for Teamorph. And we'll check in with the home audience in a week's time with all of our projects. Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us at home. And thank you, uh, everybody, uh, from, the, uh, from all participants uh, for joining us uh, for, the, for this and Paige's keynote and everybody. Um, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to get comfortable. <laughs>